a couple of words about ourselves. My name is Fabio Di Vitico, and pretty much everywhere on the internet, I'm Tico Fab, GitHub, LinkedIn, what have you. And I work as a Scala ACA consultant uh, based in Amsterdam, where I have been running this reactive Amsterdam meetup for the past few years. Uh, we're about 1,700 members now. Um, where, and we discuss everything reactive, and you know, reactive systems is our main focus. Yeah, and I'm Adam Shandor. I also live in Amsterdam, and I work as a cloud-native Kubernetes consultant. Together with my colleagues from Container Solutions, we help companies adopt all these shiny new technologies and use them in a nice way. And about a year ago, we uh, met with Fabio in the Amsterdam IT community. Also, we happened to work at the same client. And we realized that we are both focused on building distributed applications, but <clears throat> we have a very different point of view on doing that. Basically, me uh, visiting conferences and talking to people in the Kubernetes community the talk is about Docker containers, resource provisioning, networking, microservice, deployment, service discovery. And the software development is a bit of a, an afterthought uh, compared to these, these topics because this community comes from the infrastructure side. And when we started talking with Fabio, it was all about actors and streaming and asynchronous messaging and so on. And, and, but again, he was not that familiar with, with deployment patterns and microservices and so on. But we realized that in the middle of these two communities and in the middle of both of our knowledge about building distributed systems is really the goal to build reactive distributed systems. So we sat down and had a whole bunch of sessions where we were brainstorming and kind of doing a kind of research on why are these two communities so really different? Why are these two viewpoints so different and how to reconcile them? Or, or is it really some kind of a fight or which is better or whatever? And that boils down also to how Akka cluster relates to Kubernetes. Because Akka cluster is the clustering solution in the reactive world where Akka is one of the major players. And Kubernetes is, of course, the, the biggest solution in the, in the infrastructure world or in the Docker world. And there is a certain overlap between the two. Both are helping you to cluster your business logic, but does it do it in very different ways? And that's, that's where the talk's title comes from. Is it's Akka cluster versus Kubernetes. There is a bit in it of which is better for which tasks, but also we explored how the two work together. And we distilled the results of our research into a few uh, important questions we would try to answer. But before that, we will do some introductions on reactive systems, on Akka, and on Kubernetes. And then our four uh, big questions we are trying to ask is, can Kubernetes in itself make an application reactive without using Akka cluster? What value does Akka Cluster provide on top of Kubernetes if the answer was yes to the first question? Is Akka Cluster suitable for building microservices? And finally, how can Akka Cluster and Kubernetes work together in a good way? So with that, I'll hand over to Fabio. Um, yes, so we're just going to do a very light introduction on reactive systems and Akka just mentioning the concepts that are relevant for this talk. So, uh, well, I guess no talk at the Reactive Summit can go away without the Reactive Manifesto on the slides. Um, actually, the best wording about this, I've heard it from Jamie Allen at a conference last spring, where it went like, we want to build elastic and resilient systems based on message-driven architectures in order to drive uh, responsive, to, to, you know, to cater responsive experiences for our users. And, Users are obviously not only human, but also other services. And then to compare, you know, to look at Kubernetes and Akka, Akka cluster, we're looking specifically at the elastic and resilient trait. So what, what are those traits? Um, the key to elasticity is distribution. 
Um, maybe once we were thinking more in terms of scaling up, so making our machines beefier and more powerful, uh, but that has reached kind of its limits, and that's why the world is, has switched to uh, having more machines instead, um, execute jobs in parallel and things like that. Um, and the key that, en that enables uh, the, uh, this distribution is location transparency. And the concept is very, very simple. Um, just, just for an example, let's say if Adam is in New York and he wants to send me an email, it doesn't matter where I am in, in Siberia or Australia. I think I'd rather be in Australia at this point. <laughs> or if I'm in the same building where he is, it doesn't matter. He will just send an email to my email address and I will get it. He doesn't need to know where I am. And how about then resilience? Um, I think here it's just important to make a very uh, important distinction between fault tolerance and resilience, where fault tolerance um, is explained as the com where, you know, where the component is being hit, but it keeps going, maybe with reduced functionality. And the best uh, image I could find for this is, is this one. Maybe, maybe you remember this guy. It's, um, <laughs> that's the, the ending scene of the first Terminator movie where you know, they are doing horrible things to this guy, but he just keeps crawling. And so I think that's very false tolerant. Well, resilience instead tells us that upon failure, a component is able to jump back to a fully functional, fresh state. And I think you know, you know where I'm going. <laughs> that's a resilient guy. There you go. Fresh as a daisy. <laughs> so. How does ACA help us achieve these things? Um, the idea is that we started from these reactive principles. We're going to move on and, and sort of instantiate them into the reactive design patterns and then have reactive building blocks. And ACA provides exactly that, a, a toolkit to, uh, to build distributed, resilient, elastic systems uh, on the JVM, so at an application level. Um, uh, very quickly, the building blocks of ACA are actors where each actor is a basic unit of computation. Uh, each actor can contain um, its own state. So in this case, we have an Adam actor and a Fabio actor, and our state is maybe like a string with our names, um, and can only communicate via asynchronous messaging. So that's key. So you couldn't do something like this, have a reference to your actor and then a get name or something. That just doesn't work. The only way for another actor to know my name is ask me, what's your name? To which I will respond with my name. There it is. Now, having this asynchronous barrier, asynchronous distinction between these two actors help us because if we program them like this on a single JVM, for the same principle of the email as before, at that point it doesn't matter if there are two different JVMs. The, their, their semantics of communication will be the same. And so, just very quickly, how, how would that work in ACA? Well, that's our friend again. Um, and so maybe you want to uh, code a Terminator. Uh, don't, it's a bad idea. But in case you really want to do that, and maybe you want to code it in a you know, typical Java object-oriented way, then you would have a T800 instance there, right there. Um, you would do something like this. You would, you know, try walk, but then you'd need to be able to catch, say, an uh, out of legs exception. <laughs> and at that point, you will probably modify some internal state and uh, execute some alternative way of moving. How about the Akka world? So there we are. Um, we have our T thousand, which is uh, an actor now. So our code inside the actor will be a lot more simpler. It will look something like this, simply, because each actor actually has a supervisor. And <laughs> supervisors, supervisor are able to catch, like realize when there's a failure occurring. So let's say we have um, a failure, <laughs> too many holes exception, then the, the supervisor will realize that and do what's necessary, so in this case restart, may just resume, so that's your custom logic, and then your actor will just go ahead. There you go, let's watch it again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so this is 
very, very briefly uh, how ACA helps us uh, with these elasticity and resilience concepts. But then, how, what is Kubernetes? How, how does it enter the picture? Yeah, so Kubernetes uh, is, who, who has heard about Kubernetes here? Let's start with that. Awesome, all right, so it's, it's really out there. It's really all the buzz on many conferences these days. Um, so I don't really need to, need to, maybe the significance part is then pretty clear, but still, I will just uh, mention a few things and explain to those who are not all that familiar with it. Uh, Kubernetes is a container orchestration engine at its heart. So its main purpose is to run applications that are packaged as Docker containers over a set of physical or virtual machines. Without you as the uh, person up there, the helmsman holding the, uh, the wheel, doesn't have to know where that those virtual machines even exist down there. You, just, you can just launch Docker containers onto your, your container cloud, basically. And Kubernetes has grown out of this need for run Docker containers. But very interestingly, because Docker containers always uh, encapsulate a single process, which equals a microservice in a microservice architecture, or any other kind of service actually, because it's actually nearly always a, a process that you want to run, Kubernetes actually sees your application as a collection of these processes running all over the infrastructure and can provide higher level services because of this that actually help application development and help you remove certain concerns from your application and hand them over to Kubernetes. I'll get back to that later. And with this basically, Kubernetes from just being a container orchestration engine, it practically becomes a microservice platform. Hence the bit of an overlap with Aka cluster we mentioned earlier. Um, at the heart of Kubernetes, there is an, an distributed at CD database and a controller server bundled together with an API server that sees the whole cluster, sees the whole state, and you can query it and you can make modifications to how you would like your containers to run. In this uh, picture that you see, I colored different containers with different colors. They are, the different colors would be, for example, part of your front end. And then you have five instances of your front end running and two instances of your uh, back end running. Um, so Kubernetes, and then Kubernetes can manage things for you, like keeping always two instances of your back end up and running. So it understands your application beyond just it being uniform containers. And the importance of Kubernetes is evidenced today by all three major cloud providers, even though it's a originally coming out of Google, Google has made such an effort to make this a truly open project for everyone that in the end, both AWS and Azure had, have adopted it and now are offering a managed Kubernetes service. Because the hard part with Kubernetes is not the usage, it's the, the running it. And, uh, and that's something you want to avoid if you can. So if you're on a cloud provider these days, one of the, the three major cloud providers, you don't need to run Kubernetes yourself, you get it out of the box. And imagine how much uh, effort did it take to, to, for AWS or Azure to adopt a Google technology. So that also shows how really Kubernetes is viewed by the industry as a open source technology that everybody can adopt, kind of like the Linux kernel that is really safe to use and there is no pressure from any one company on the evolution of the, of the uh, product. So then the big question is, can Kubernetes make my application reactive? Kubernetes doesn't offer, is not working on the application layer like a cluster does. And that offers some advantages. First of all, everything that Kubernetes does can do with anything that, that you can package as a Docker container, which is most technology stacks. 
meaning you get the same services whether you're working with Node.js, Java applications, Akka applications, let's say if we don't use a cluster but just Akka inside the container, um, doesn't matter, Kubernetes gives you the same services. So how do we get elasticity? We have uh, three types of containers running on our cluster. Uh, one, four make up the UI, three make up the backend, and the others make up processing. Uh, these service abstractions on Kubernetes practically become load balancers with their own IP address. So they allow traffic between these containers. So all the containers on Kubernetes can talk to each other. Everybody gets an IP address and a virtual network under it. That's one of the base features of Kubernetes. But then the service abstraction gives you a, makes uh, the green containers be all part of a processing service where Kubernetes creates a virtual IP address. If you send packets to that IP address, then they will land at one of the processing containers. So now our backend container that is talking to the processing right now doesn't need to know what are the IP addresses of the processing containers. They, it can just address the load balancer. And it doesn't even need to know the address of the load balancer because uh, that IP address will be written into the cluster-wide DNS server. So you practically will just address, I don't know, if you will be talking through HTTP, then you would just address HTTP slash slash processing. And you don't need to know what's happening. All of the service discovery and load balancing is happening on the network level without any modification to your application. And the same goes for backend. And we can see how this achieves elasticity, right? It doesn't matter how many containers are making up the processing service at this moment. We can very easily scale up and down and, and achieve elasticity because we have full location transparency over the cluster. So the same mechanisms also help us with resilience. If one of the processing containers burns down, Kubernetes detects this because it's monitoring all our containers all the time and we'll just remove it from the load balancer, restart it somewhere else and add it back into the load balancer. A very simple mechanism which works actually very well and gets you very far in terms of resilience. Of course it doesn't, uh, it cannot really take into account any very application specific things that you might need for certain specialized applications, but for a very large section of applications that people are making, this is more than enough to keep them up and running and make them resilient. So I would say that Kubernetes can take you very far in making your applications reactive. And then comes the question, if that is true, also, by the way, whoever doesn't agree with us, feel free to blast us on Twitter. We would love this talk to be a conversation starter and a bit of a provocative thing. So go for us. We have our uh, Twitter handles up there on most slides. So yeah, don't hold back. So if Kubernetes can make your application quite elastic or maybe even fully how, as we look at the definition, um, what does Akka cluster provide? on top of Kubernetes? Right, so to find out an answer to these questions, we uh, really were looking for an, a suitable example. And we actually went back to um, a thing of mine. So my very first journey in the reactive world that happened about uh, yeah five years ago already, 2013. So I built this little startup, right, where the idea was to enable cross-device communications using uh, you know, fingers, uh, hand gestures. So you could swipe things from one screen to another or, or pinch two screens together. And so I actually built that. And um, at the end, I had one, one paying customer. I was very proud of that, but it wasn't, <laughs> wasn't, wasn't enough to, uh, to keep the business going. But uh, so we will use this example to try and answer these questions. And I want to show you a couple of use cases that we, we built back then. So there you go, you could pinch, um, make a ball appear in a, you know, the right place at the right resolution, or another easy one, uh, transfer pictures from one phone to another. You, you can see that these devices are not exactly the latest models. Um, yeah. So, uh, so there's that, or um, probably my favorite one, 
as this one. Um, once you establish a connection between two devices, then you could just move things like seamlessly like that. And uh, I thought that was pretty cool. Um, maybe I could envision, you know, uh, exchanging weapons in, uh, in role play games or something like that. But that's history now. Um, so anyway. <laughs> well, it's not. We just revived it, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, well, all this communication actually happened through a central, centralized backend service. And this service had a few requirements to meet. Um, for instance, we needed to be able to uh, manage many devices concurrently. You know, multiple phones would connect at the same time. Hold state for each device. So each device has a location, maybe information about um, the, 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 the pairing with the zine, maybe which, which shape I am, do I have right now, and things like that. Um, well, this engine should deal with short device life cycles. Phone connects, disconnects all the time. And then allow a fast bidirectional communication between devices. Um, so like in the case of the, you know, sending a picture or, or, or the shapes. Uh, so that's why after some research I thought that, you know, Akka and the reactive, the, all, all that world was a perfect fit. So let's see a simplified version how that could work. Uh, let's say we have a uh, WebSocket listener there, because we want to have a bi-directional uh, channel with phones, to which a phone can connect, and then a message is sent to the phone manager. Phone manager creates, spawns a phone actor, and for the moment, that's it. When another phone comes up, again, phone connected, we got a new actor created, and then we check if there's a match between them. Now, in this case, there isn't, but then a third phone will come, and same strategy again, an actor is created. Let's investigate if there's a match, and there actually is a match right now. So now phone one knows it matched phone three, sends a message you matched with me, and from that point on, communications happens directly between these two actors without going through any intermediary. So the, you would say that the logical line of communication would be, would be like this one. And um, this, is, this is nice, it works, but then we'll have one issue that at some point we will have too many phones and one single JVM will not be able to, to hold them because obviously millions of people are going to use this. <laughs> and uh, so how do we solve this, this issue? Well, uh, we can use Arca cluster to actually divide our workers and, and masters in different nodes. So you will have the multiple nodes will be able to hold these things, and you can add node as needed. And so in such a scenario, what happens? A new device connects, um, we ask the phone with less load on it to create an actor that represents it. Now there's, there's some messages being exchanged, but in the end, what's important is that if a match is found, then those two phones will be able to communicate between them exactly like if they were on one single JVM. And so this is something really powerful. An architecture would kind of look like this, let's say, um, where you would have a, a gateway service instance, and then different instances of our phone service, and then actors on it that really talk to each other. And that <coughs> arrow there, makes a whole lot of difference for a whole lot of business cases. Um, and so you could say this is a stateful microservice architecture. Yeah, so yeah, with that nice programming model that you can get with the two phones communicating, actually in your code communicating. So we also wanted to make the, the to show the difference between how one would build such an application, how usually people build such applications without, when they don't have something like a cluster available. So usually the solution is to uh, push the problem of distributed data into a distributed database, which means you will have your phone service instance uh, scalable because let's say it's doing some business logic that you do want to be able to scale also for fault tolerance. 
but the, the heavy lifting will be done inside a, a distributed database um, that can hopefully scale up to as many phones as you need it. And this can work for many applications. There is nothing necessarily wrong with this, except for the database being uh, a generic database. So it might be slow if your queries happen to be of that kind. And also your programming model will be way uglier because instead of writing that nice code where a phone is sending messages to another phone, you will be writing queries and inserts and deletes on the database and then uh, depending on the database to, uh, to sync this uh, and shard it and so on. So, and this is usually how people implement similar applications on Kubernetes. And Kubernetes actually, so how would, how would to, to go a bit into the details now, um, the toolkit that Kubernetes gives you, because also you could say that this you could also do without Kubernetes. This could be the phone service instances, could be virtual machines on Amazon, or could be Heroku instances or whatever. But uh, Kubernetes gives you some very nice tools to make, uh, to make it very easy to actually accomplish this, because there are operational and other uh, problems you would need to be solving. First of all, if we go from left to right, Kubernetes provides you something called an ingress, which uh, will uh, ingest traffic into your cluster and you can do HTTP header or, uh, or path matching and whatever you need to do to get the right traffic to the right uh, services. Second, it provides you something called a stateful set which runs uh, containers that always have an identity. It's, it's pretty hard to explain stateful set so there isn't time in this talk. But think of it as a control mechanism to launch multiple instances of some kind of stateful service. We did not deal in this talk with the WebSocket listener. It obviously would also be a stateful service that needs scaling. So in this case, uh, let's just mostly skip that one. The interesting part is the deployment and the database. So the phone service instance you want to run X number of instances, maybe depending on the traffic load, maybe just depending on whatever else you need. Kubernetes provides a, uh, an object called a deployment that if you tell Kubernetes to run this deployment with uh, the type of container that I want in this deployment is phone service and I want three instances of it, Kubernetes will make sure three instances of your phone service will be running all the time on the cluster. If a virtual machine under the cluster dies, it will move all the containers from that machine to another machine and make sure uh, to the rest of the application it looks like nothing has happened. For this, you also need the whole service discovery and load balancing mechanism I was explaining in the earlier slide. So that's uh, this service object just left of the deployment. So basically the WebSocket listener will be talking to this service when it wants to send messages to the phone service and the service will be doing the load balancing and sending the packets. And again, the database, we will need multiple instances of it, but we will need those instances to have uh, identity because they are not equal, because they are stateful. So for that, again, we would be using a stateful set. So stateful set is very similar to deployment, but it gives the containers identity. And yeah, that's kind of vague, I know, but unfortunately there is no time to really go into the details of that. So to contrast this with the previous architecture, uh, no more talking between phones, everything moved into the database and we have a very different uh, architecture. So, um, with that said, uh, there is another perspective we explored is let's say we do want a microservice architecture because uh, of the usual reasons like having several teams wanting to deploy completely independently of each other, not having to wait for a release train and everybody get on board and now we go together to put the monolith into production. Um, so how does Akka cluster which actually was uh, born before the idea of microservices? And we saw a very interesting thing on even uh, 
light band's thoughts seem to evolve on this topic because in a blog post written by a light band customer called iHeart in 2016, they declare we've used DACA cluster as our microservice platform. And Right now in the ACA documentation in the summer of 2018, a clarification has appeared saying you should not use ACA cluster as your microservice platform. Uh, we will uh, shed some light on this, on, uh, and actually there you have, the, the truth is you have options, and all of them have their pros and cons as usual. The answer to everything is it depends in engineering. Um, but so the, the, at the heart of the question is, our, our actors microservices. We have a clustering solution called Kubernetes that runs microservices and a clustering solution called Akka running something that are actors. So our, our actors microservices, it also determines the overlap between Kubernetes and Akka cluster. So if we look at this little table, um, they all check all the, the boxes here. Actors in NACA cluster provide you location transparency. You don't address actors running on some node. You address the actor and you don't care where it runs. Same for microservices and Kubernetes. They provide you resilience, as we already explained, and scalability or elasticity. Um, but the difference lies on this last row I just added is that actors are not independently deployable. So even though microservices in many ways are an architectural pattern, but one of their core, the core reason why they, they were invented was to be able to independently deploy that development teams don't need to wait for each other. And actors in NACA cluster being classes in a JVM don't really uh, tick that box. So we have different options of building microservices using NACA cluster. First one is the one code base, one cluster option, which is kind of a distributed monolith or a uh, classical distributed application. I like that term uh, Lightband uses in the, uh, in the documentation, uh, where all your code is in one monolithic code base, and then you run multiple instances of it, let's say on Kubernetes. We'll be running everything on Kubernetes. So from now on, if Kubernetes is not in the picture, just imagine it's there underneath. But at the moment, not that important for this, uh, what we are discussing right now with ACA cluster and microservices. So different types of actors are in the same code base in the same ACA cluster. So if you want to replace the WebSocket gateway, this is the same application still, then you would need to redeploy also the logic that handles the phone uh, nodes or the phone actors. Another way would be to actually separate the two code bases and deploy the, the WebSo WebSocket gateway separately and but still put them all into one ACA cluster. So the ACA cluster would have different types of nodes. And this would have the advantage that even though you separated your code base, you can still use actor messaging to communicate between all the possible actors, between the WebSocket gateway and the phones on the ACA cluster, which actually is a big advantage. And this is the, uh, the architecture the iHeart guys were going for. And that's why they, from their point of view, ACA cluster is their microservice platform because you don't really care at this point what's underneath. You probably, Kubernetes is a nice platform to run this all on top of, but from your application's point of view, you don't really care. Um, so, but the downside of this one is that you're still pretty tightly coupled because of actors communicating using Java classes and Java serialization. So the, the coupling is still more than you would really like with an ideal microservice application. You're also coupled into technology stacks, not just running on the JVM, building things in Java or Scala, but even using actors. So let's say you would want to re-implement your WebSocket gateway, maybe with a completely third-party technology that you could just run. You, that will not be able to communicate with the backend. So this would be the, the, and this is what's currently on the, this, this architecture is what's on, uh, on the documentation of, uh, of ACA cluster. This is the ideal uh, ACA cluster microservice architecture where you put your single type of service into an ACA cluster and the other service will also be an ACA cluster. So you can utilize inter-actor communication 
but you won't do that between the different services, but there you will use either HTTP, event queues, gRPC, or whatever technology agnostic and more easily evolvable uh, protocol. So these are the, the options to use like a cluster for a microservice application. And then in our final chapter, we will look at how Akka cluster and Kubernetes can work together in a really nice way. Already the previous example, you could see how you might run all those nodes and everything with Kubernetes. And there is another uh, thing also that Kubernetes can really help you with. Uh, this is the uh, uh, picture of the formation of the star system. And so we will be looking at cluster formation around the Kubernetes API server. So we want to form an Akka cluster on top of a Kubernetes cluster. And you can see where our confusion with Fabio came from originally, that you're running clusters on top of clusters, and is this really necessary? There is added complexity and stuff. So the Kubernetes API server, it's a bit more complicated in reality, but let's say it's the, the, the brain of Kubernetes, and you can ask it questions. You can ask where any container runs, what are their IP addresses, uh, all the services, all the deployments, everything is accessible and modifiable through the Kubernetes API server. So you can very nicely build, uh, build on top of this. So when you want to form an ACA cluster, let's say three nodes happen to, to start up that all want to join into one ACA cluster. But you would, they already get IP addresses, and we also give them a label called cluster, the value of which will be my cluster. So we can also have different clusters, lots of clusters, clusters, clusters. Um, and to form these into an ACA cluster and use Kubernetes for that, these would all ask the API servers, are there any other uh, containers or pods running, which pod is a container on Kubernetes, to keep it simple, uh, that have the, the label cluster, my cluster. And the Kubernetes API server will tell them, yeah, there are, to each of them, that there are two other, or actually will tell each of them that there are three, including yourself. And with that information, they will be able, they know each other's IP addresses and they can form an ACA cluster. And they can also keep polling the API server or listening for events from the API server and immediately know if something's wrong with one of the, uh, one of the nodes. Of course, ACA cluster also has its own mechanism to watching uh, for, for dead nodes, so there is also an overlap in that. But they can also detect that a completely new node has, is entering the cluster by looking at the API server. Also, this new node will ask the API server where are all my other bodies, and yeah, oops, okay, that's, I hate when that happens. <laughs> yeah, okay, so you saw that the cluster was formed. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the in a, is this showing the same thing, but just from a different point of view? So in the end, what you get is virtual machines on top of which run Kubernetes pods, which are containers, which contain a JVM, on which form an ACA cluster, which run actors, which in the end can communicate. And Kubernetes makes it very trivial to be able to implement this cluster formation logic much easier than if you don't really know what kind of infrastructure you will be running on top of. Actually, there are even several methods to do this. And Lightband is right now implementing a library called ACA Bootstrap, which frees you from even having to implement this algorithm of talking to the API server. It does exactly this algorithm for you, or the other one, which I don't have time to explain. And yeah, with that, you have very easy time of running an ACA cluster on top of Kubernetes. Right, so um, just as uh, our conclusion slides, uh, let's go back a little bit to the start. And so we've seen so if we're looking at, a, at an ACA system, you'll see that actor, actors die sometimes. A supervisor will, will realize that, take the necessary steps, and everything is happy again. On the Kubernetes side, you might say that if a pod dies, then the deployment controller will realize, maybe restart it, and, and we're happy again. And if you see similarities there, you're not alone. Don't worry. 
I think that's where the confusion comes from. But in reality, what's happening is this, that they really are working at two different levels. And um, so actually this, so you, ACA allows you to catch different failures than Kubernetes allows you to, which allows us, allows us to, to draw a sort of scale of resilience. So we bundled uh, different kinds of failures in different categories. So on the far left, you have our friends. <laughs> and all the way to the right, uh, more and more tragedy happening. Um, and so onto this kind of scale, we could map that ACA really works very, very well on that, that side of the things. And as ACA cannot maybe uh, help you there anymore, then Kubernetes can. So uh, JVM errors, um, you know, explosions, hardware failure to some extent, and well, what, what, what happens when Skynet attacks? Yeah, um, that really depends on who you're, uh, <laughs> on, uh, so uh, we, we have some uh, Microsoft people here, and uh, you wanna ask what's their plan for that? <laughs> And um, yeah, so well, this shows us how ACA and Kubernetes really sort of complement each other um, on, on, on the terms of resilience. If we're looking at location transparency, well, that's a similar thing. Guess what? Because Kubernetes, you know, you don't need to know the IP address of every virtual machine that you're, that you're, that you're having, that Google is running for you or, 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 you, or, or Amazon, because Kubernetes does it for you. Then within virtual machines, you will have pods and then, within pods, actors that talk to each other, and they don't need to know each other's IP address, thanks to the fact that Kubernetes does it for you. So also on the location transparency side, there is, there is a nice cooperation there. So, well, um, this is a, a recap where we went through. We uh, introduced a few concepts, starting from the reactive principles, and then we answered our questions. Can Kubernetes make an application reactive uh, by itself? Uh, maybe, to some extent. Uh, what value does ACA cluster provide on top of Kubernetes? And we identified stateful services as a prime, prime use case for ACA and ACA cluster. Uh, is ACA cluster suitable for a microservice architecture? Um, yeah, it depends. Um, Lightband says maybe uh, not. Uh, it depends on your case. And how can ACA cluster and Kubernetes work together? That's what we've tried to sum up a little bit. And even though the title of this talk is ACA Cluster versus Kubernetes. I really believe that if you use them together, you get superpowers. And um, I would as far as saying that Kubernetes should be, a, to me, a recommended way to, to run your ACA clustered applications. And what I learned from this is that to build uh, stateful applications, probably using ACA Cluster on top is, is a very, very good idea. So uh, here's a few references that we use for inspiration and, and learning. Obviously, uh, the, the first two books, you've maybe read them. Um, but that's, uh, that was our research. So uh, thanks yeah, for those, attending. Those two books were a big inspiration for this yeah. uh, talk. Thanks. So one of the advantages of using uh, Akka for the clustering is that you can use, leverage this type system in, in Scala. Um, in the in the newer ACA typed uh, world, and I'm wondering um, if there's any opportunities to uh, have a distributed type system in in terms of uh, Kubernetes. Like if we build that on top of Tasty or something like that, where we could detect uh, whether these services are compatible um, at deploy time. Yeah. So Kubernetes gives you nothing for that, so that's very clear. <laughs> and there are then protocols that, like Protobuf, for example, that tries to be, tries to do that and being technology agnostic by actually implementing a client for, for, any, uh, for many technology stacks. So yeah, that's definitely something you're losing if you're not using a cluster. Um, with Kubernetes, you have a few different ways to deploy new code bases, and in particular situations with where you change the the operations that happen within the cluster. Do you have effective strategies to manage new clusters and new code bases coming in to those? Yeah. So what Kubernetes gives you out of the box is a rolling upgrade. 
So it starts starting up new instances of your service with the new code base and depending on how you tune the strategy, it might shut down an old one every time a new one successfully joins the load balancer. So in that case, for example, your client logic has to account that any particular packet can either go to the new or to the old service, which is a big challenge in microservice architectures uh, that you can't just rely on suddenly a switch being there in the services. Noth nothing else is provided by Kubernetes out of the box. Uh, but actually, they are pretty easy to implement because of this whole very nice uh, programming model of the API server. And then there are also technologies that, uh, like uh, Spinnaker, for example, that, that implement other strategies for Kubernetes. I don't really like an outside system, like a CI CD system, doing this for you, but it's not bad. But I like your Kubernetes doing it. So I would like to see people write more in Kubernetes ways of doing these uh, these upgrades like blue-green deployments and canary deployments and so on. Okay. Do you have any recommendations it, within a system itself if you're trying to route messages to go to different um, pieces in the code base based on what what is deployed you mean, there? What do you mean by different pieces? Um, can you trust the result of a new code base versus the old code base and within the cluster? Right. So. The Kubernetes mechanism for this is you have a service, and actually a service routes to any containers that have, or any pods in Kubernetes that have, the, have a certain label. And that's what you can play around with. So if you need something special for your application, you can build a controller, like another container that would talk to the API server of Kubernetes and manage these labels flipping the labels on the right containers, and with that, automatically, the traffic gets rerouted to the newer ones. So you can do like a blue-green deployment by just routing to the old ones until all the new ones come up and then suddenly switching the traffic over. That's pretty trivial to do if you go to like actually coding against the API server. Maybe let's pick this up afterwards. I'm not sure if that was a good enough answer. Mm -hmm. 